that is there is so much truth to that and when you really when you think about music from the standpoint of even a phrase there is a, there is a a shape to every phrase and there is a a line to every phrase and in every single um every single movement i really uh, the more and more i study it the more that i believe that to get the best sound out of your singers out of your instrument is when you can really connect the visual the imagination and the movement to the sound you are then shaping it and you are interpreting it and that's really where the artistry comes in convinced on the the importance of the arts in our world and i will fight to make it a reality for these kids Hello, welcome to And If Love Remains. I am your host, Mike Levitt, and I am very, very excited to have my next guest on today, um, Lisa Blasi. She is a good friend of mine. We've shared the stage together several times, um, hope to do it again someday. And uh, we also, um, she is one of the most generous and uh, people that I know. Um, she's a fabulous singer, an amazing artist, uh, and just a, a wonderful teacher and mentor to, to young people. And she started a new book, or she's written a new book um, called Something to, uh, Something to Sing About. Lisa, how can people find your book? So at this time, the book can be found on the publisher's website. It's called Beaten Path Publications. Uh, I also have a blog, um, and I can send you that info. Um, That'd be great. And you can find the link to the book on the blog as well. And then the last way that you could get it is it's going to be in the West Music Summer Catalog that's coming out. Uh, and West Music is uh, just a, a big distributor of instruments and curriculum for music educators. So they're actually going to be distributing it too. So, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So, and we'll talk about the book in, in a second. I do want to just kind of give people a, a flavor of, of Lisa, who you are and, <laughs> and what you're about. You, you grew up in New York. Is that right? That is right. Long Island. Yes. Long Island. And, and, um, and tell me about your, your musical. Like when did you start singing? Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. So it's, it's an interesting uh, journey I've had. I, I started, um, I started dancing when I was really young and I've always had an affinity for the arts. I've always been extremely just, uh, in love with dance and movement and music. And when I was little, uh, my parents would always tell me the story of whenever there was a piano in a room, I would just go and sit, sit at it. I didn't even know how to play. I just was, had such an affinity to it. Um, and I guess when I was, I guess I was about six, I started taking piano lessons and my teacher ended up moving. So I played for a few years, I got another teacher, and then I ended up just sort of playing for a while without a teacher. Um, and I was homeschooled till I was in 10th grade. And I was involved in different choirs, and I played the flute for a little bit, and just over the years had different musical, uh, in you know, inspirations and involved in different things. And then I think it right. was when I started high school, I went, I went to a, a Christian pub, just a private school in, in New York, and I joined... I think I joined choir when I was in 11th grade and my teacher was one of my biggest inspirations. I absolutely loved him. His name is Mr. Jackson. And I remember how much I found out how much I love to sing. And I always enjoyed singing, but I, it wasn't ever anything that I, I was, I just, I guess I didn't realize how much I loved it. And, um, in, in 11th grade, we did a production of, uh, sound of music. And I was in theater class as well. And I was always very, I was very quiet. Um, I was, you know, I had recently started going to school and I, from being homeschooled and I just, it was very quiet. And I just remember how much I, I love the stage. Um, and I remember I auditioned for the sound of music and I ended up getting the part of Liesl. I had no idea that I could sing. I, I had no idea that that was even something that right. I could do. And, um, I fell in love with, I just fell in love with the stage and yeah. I, 
it was, it was like, I had, can't even tell you. I felt, I felt like I found my, just, I found the deepest passion and I continued with choir throughout high school. We did Les Mis, um, my senior year, I got to be Fontaine and my, just my desire and my love of, of learning uh, more about music and music theory and singing, it just grew and grew and grew. And my teacher was such a huge inspiration. And I remember he said to me, how he encouraged me to, to major in music education. And I was so, uh, I was just very convinced that it would, I couldn't do it. I was like, I don't, I don't think I could do it. I don't think that I could do it. And I remember he really, uh, encouraged me and said, go for it. So, and after my senior year of high school, uh, my family moved from Long Island to Arizona and I went to Arizona state and I, um, I ended up, had never taken private voice lessons ever. I just, it was just um, something that I I did never had. Yeah. Yeah. But I had a lot to learn. So I auditioned for uh, the music program. My, as soon as we moved out here and I didn't get in the first time and I actually almost um, decided not to try out again. I was going to major in biology (laughs) because I love science too. And um, I remember my mother who was, my biggest role model said to me, you need to try one more time. And I was, I I was, I was almost not going to, but I thought, you know, all right, fine. I'll do it one more time. I ended up, um, the Lord led me to some incredible voice teachers out here who really, um, you know, taught me a lot about how much I really didn't realize about singing, classical singing, you know, and um, I auditioned a second time and I got in and uh, that was probably one of the best things that happened to me. And from that point on, I um, I sang in choir. I was able to take piano lessons again um, and actually did that as a secondary concentration. Um, I got to sing in vocal jazz ensembles. I studied with amazing voice teachers. Um, I did my master's at ASU as well. And one of the things I would say that I just am so Um, I look at this as the favor of God was over the years of uh, from even since graduating, I have been given uh, they have just come into my life. The most amazing mentors, um, amazing instructors, amazing Uh, teachers. I am constantly humbled and growing um, as a musician, as a teacher, as a mentor. And I would say that I stand on the shoulders of some incredible people and they were, I believe, divinely handpicked and put in my path. And there was nothing that I did to deserve that. <laughs> and um, they are the ones who have really brought me to where I am today. You know, that's so that's an amazing tribute. And it yeah. is true. I know. I know for me, like um, my uh, um, having, having the opportunity to to sing with with some really interesting people and, and being able to study um, even just one or two lessons with with um, with people can really change your whole outlook on yes. music and singing. And, and it, 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 it's amazing. Just one or two things can, can change a life course in a way. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. And, um, so, um, so you, you graduated, you, re, you got your master's. Um, what are some of the, what are some of the, 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 performances and plays that you've done what are some of the some of the highlights of of your performing so i i got to do um let's see what else did i get to i was in bye bye birdie which was a lot of fun fun. i got to be um I got to be one of the teens, which was just so fun. So I got to do a lot of the dancing numbers and that. Um, The telephone hour was probably my favorite, favorite scene in that whole thing. And then I got to be in that same show, a character called uh, Gloria Rasputin. And she's this kind of like, she's just like this little... uh, what would you say? She, uh, she comes into Albert's office and she's kind of not really competition for Rosie, but she's just yeah. kind of a doozy, you know, just kind right. of a 
bubble gums chewing kind of like, you know, so it, it's such it, I, I happen to love playing characters that I am nothing like, because I think for me, it's such a fun thing to get to play. Cause I would never do that in real life, you know? So that's right. why I love to play characters that I would never you get to experience the, you know, experience the other side. Yes. That- yes. <laughs> right. On stage when it's not real life. So that right. was a lot of fun. And then, um, I got to do, uh, I also got to be in The King and I, and in that I was just one of the many wives, but I was also an understudy for um, Tuptim, which was fun to learn the parts. And then um, I also got to be um, in the dance scene. There's a big ballet, The Uh Evil King. (laughs) So I had to wear like this crazy mask and dance in that. And that was, that was really fun too. A little scary, but I ended up managing to stay on my two feet, which was, which was great. Hey, yeah. rule number yeah, one. Yeah, because I, I definitely am <laughs> more dizzy than most dancers. But so, yeah, so that was, uh, that was fun. And then let's see. I, okay. This was probably my favorite show. It was, um, this was actually not a musical. This was just a straight theater production. It's called Parfumery. Um, okay. It's 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 actually the original play script for um, you know the story you've got mail and little shop around the corner. Um, okay, so you've got mail was actually based on little shop around the corner with Jimmy Stewart. Um, and then there was also, um, in the good old summertime with Ju- Judy Garland. So there's been right. many, many, um, many different movies or, uh, you know, again, you've got, you've got mail as a classic with Meg Ryan and it just kind of bit based around that same story. Yes, that's yes. my idea. So this was the original, original parfumery oh, came wow. out in the thirties. It, it takes place in Hungary and um, anyway, I got to play the lead in that a few years, I guess, 2018. So a couple years ago. And um, I actually haven't done a whole lot of straight theater because usually I've done musicals, you know. Right. But I enjoy that so much. And um, that was probably one of my favorite experiences. And um, I just I remember you get very one of my I think one of the, the biggest blessings of for anybody who has never gotten to try theater i would highly recommend it you get so close with the people that you are um you're working with you know and you build these almost like a family bond and a lot of the people and i'll just when i had first started uh when i was first starting out in the production just were completely from different walks of life. And, you know, I mean, it's fine, but just, I just remember there was just not a lot of reasons why I would have ever interacted with these people probably unless I was in the show. But by the end of the experience, they were like family. And um, it was just, yeah, it was such a fun experience. And just, I grew a lot as an artist during that time. And I'm just, had to, there was a lot of different elements to that character. And um, yeah, it, it was a really special show. Yeah. My, my son, he loves acting and, and he wants to describe the stage as, you know, this uh, box of energy mm. that when you walk on and, I like and I can, I can relate to that. That's really true. And, and you're right. As far as like, when you're, when you're in rehearsals and you're blood, sweat and tearing with people, you know, for months, you know, before a, a production, you get close to them and you get to know them and, and there's nothing like, it's funny. Acting seems to bring out the real people sometimes, yes, <laughs> you know, it, yes. it's kind of counterintuitive, but it's yes. really true. Yeah. And there's a certain element where you are so dependent upon each other. You know what I mean? Like there's right. such a dependence on, um, <laughs> get the line right at the yes! right time. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I would always mess up this one scene. And I just remember there was one of the characters who who knew that I always messed it up. So he would, he would just be preemptively waiting and would just kind of carry me through. It was so funny. Oh, but yes. Beautiful. Yeah, that was probably. So I'm trying to think. I feel like that was the last big show that I've done. I've done more directing of shows in the last couple years, oh, which has been another that has. I've enjoyed that so much. The mentoring side. But I'm kind of itching to be in another show again. Yeah. That, that, yes. Yeah. That sounds fun. 
Well, and and it, I mentioned at the beginning how how genu, genu, generous I can say the word I promise I speak <laughs> uh, English um, <laughs> how generous you are. Um, I think the first thing we I met was when you put on a um, a concert a uh, um, uh, the benefit concert oh, uh, yeah benefit concert concert for people in Houston. This was several years ago when they had the the floods. Um, and then again, you did another one uh, not too long ago, a year or two ago. Um, what 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 prompted you to do those sorts of things? That's very, I mean, that, that's unusual to step out of the box in that way. Well, um, I think that I have a real heart for people and for when I see a need. And um, I think I just, I view, I view the resources that God has given me as I look at them as, as gifts from him. And um, my hope is always to use, to be able to bless other people and to use the resources that I have as a way, as a means to help others. And I think when all of the things that were going on with the Houston situation were happening, I just was, I remember just thinking, what can I do? You know, sometimes you feel so, um, powerless to make a change. And I've just come to find that there's a strength in numbers. And when you can rally people to come together for a cause to, to help and to bring um, relief in whatever way, if it's monetary relief, emotional relief, or whatever it might be, um, that's something worth its time. And that's just something that really motivates me, I guess you could say. And, um, bringing people together for the, even just for the arts, it's, it's such an extension of who we are. We, I think as musicians, as performers, there's such a joy we have in preparing and performing and then using that as a means to be able to bless, um, a people group in need. I, I feel like there's, that's one of the biggest joys that I get, you know? Yeah. For sure. That's, and, and, and I felt that from you and I felt that for myself as I participated. It's, it's really true that when you're able to, to, um, give of yourself, give what you have, you know, and it is funny as, as artists, as sometimes I feel, I have a little bit of a complex, um, from the standpoint that I I often feel like I don't have much to give, um, you know, because everything I give is kind of intangible. It's, it's my voice, it's my music, it's my, it's, but, but when you're able to do something like that, it can turn into something that's tangible and really, really useful and helpful. And, and it, it needs an organizing force and, and you've been that, and that's oh, been a wonderful thing. Thank you. And what you just said is very interesting about it being intangible, but just to, I mean, just to reiterate that the experience that you give someone when there's a, a saying I love, it says that music washes away the dust of everyday life. I don't know if you ever heard that quote, no, but I, I love that quote and giving somebody a, a bath, so to speak from every, from just life is sometimes the best gift that you can give. You may never see the material aspect of it, but when you think about it, the most poignant, beautiful things in life are not material things. They never were, you know, our souls are not made out of material. And I think right. that is when you think of the gift of giving somebody music or an experience that brings them to a different place, that is a very important, even if it's not physically made up of matter, you know? Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That is really, that's, that's really true. And, 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 and it's funny how that energy ultimately does turn into something that um, is part of Matt. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, it, like it, it, it's the energy that bonds people together that allows people to be, to, to build something, to, to create something. And um, it's, it's very, very wonderful. Um, I wanted to, to bring up, so, so you wrote this book and it's called something to sing about. And I'd love to hear um, what prompted you to, to write this book. So, okay. So something to sing about, um, it has a very long story. <laughs> By the way, I noticed it, is it is that your mom that drew the, yes. the, the illustrations? Yes. That is fabulous. I know, isn't I have a very talented it's, mother. She did all the illustrations in the book. It's adorable. Oh, I'm very, very lucky. Um, yes, I would just be like, Mom, can you draw this? Can you draw that? And, and then she would just do it. I mean, it was amazing. Um so 
so kind of just to give just a little bit of a background, my, my background, um, again, doing my degree in music education, um, I am a huge proponent and fan of the ORF approach, you know, the ORF method, um, mm -hmm. just, you know, implemented and designed by Carl ORF. And uh, I also really love the Kodai method as well. And the blend of those two together, I have just seen work really well in my in my classroom can you can you just a lot of people who are listening to this don't don't know what that is can you do a quick description yeah of, of definitely so the orf approach is it's basically a methodology of teaching music to children and it revolves a lot around movement um, improvisation creativity cooperative learning um learning uh basically in a socratic way so in other words when i say that you're giving kids an experience, a tangible experience before you label and say, Hey kids, this is a quarter note, or Hey, this is a crescendo. You're giving them the experience where they're participating actively in the production of the music and then you label it. So right. you're not just lecturing, but they are a part of the learning and the creating in the process. And it's just very much proven that that's how people, adults even, learn and retain is when they are actually involved in the process. It's not uh, passive learning, it's active learning. So, well, and it's also, it sounds like it's very much, um, for example, learning to speak before learning to read. Yes. Like you need to, you need to learn what th these are symbols and what do these symbols mean? Well, they don't mean anything until you experience them. Exactly. Like why, what would be the point of teaching somebody a baby to read if they haven't even learned how to, to talk yet, you know? Right. So I pers I love I love that approach and I've just seen it work. And um, so that's kind of the ORF method. The Kodai method is, um, it's a very like singing base and um, Kodai was also a composer and really uh, was very much, uh, one of the things that he did, which was so cool is really gathered a collection of folk tunes. Um, and Kodai uh, was from Hungary and really gathered a wide base of national songs, you know, from his country and um, very folk based, based a lot on solfege. So really teaching kids to to read music in a very pedagogically sound way. Um so, again, the, the pairing of these two, I have found to be very, very uh, solid and just lays a very strong foundation for introducing musical concepts to children. Um, so, so anyway, so I've, I've had about 10 years of, of teaching experience in the classroom, and I was able to do some post- graduate work a couple years ago at ASU. I got to do some work in conducting, got to take some research method class and had a just a wealth of really interesting knowledge that was presented to me that I got to research different professors I got to interact with. And um, it's always interesting getting to take these courses after you've been in the classroom for a while. It just totally changes how you view and how you yeah. interact with the knowledge and the information. And it's a whole paradigm. Oh, shift, isn't it? yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, the biggest learning happens in the classroom and then you, you reassess and you reevaluate your process going back into these classes. And, um, in 2017, I started, um, I got to present actually at the National ORF Conference in Fort Worth, Texas. And that's with all different music educators from across the country. Um, previously, I had kind of built up some, I got to do some presenting around uh, Arizona. And then this was, you know, was a really big honor um, presenting in yeah. Texas. I got to just meet some fascinating music teachers from, you know, around the country and was asked to present. Um, around the country at different different chapters or chapters of different music educators wow. in different in different states and at that point i had you know kind of what i was doing in my classroom and what i was presenting was really about an hour of you know material i would always run out of time but that was kind of the context you know you're doing your own thing in your classroom and yeah. um I had never really take the time to really like kind of write it out. And um, so when I had the first 
when they, I was asked to present, there's like five hours of material, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to talk about? You know, I haven't like really written this out. Um, so that kind of motivated me to be like, well, I need to really process what I'm doing and really write this out. And um, in the meantime, back in 2018, spring of 2018, um, I ended up having to step down from the program I was in due to um, some health issues. And again, God is so good. And it honestly turned out to be the biggest blessing. Um, during that time, I remember Isn't that how it works. Oh my gosh. I, it's just incredible. I was thinking to myself, what am I doing? Like, what is going on? I, I was just at a, um, a crossroads and it was a very, very tough season. But I will tell you, during that time, um, all I could do was an independent study. And I, so that was how I was able to continue to stay enrolled. Um, yeah. And I spent my time, I remember thinking, I like just, I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing. And during that time, I'll tell you, Mike, I literally researched and researched and researched on um, just on the voice and on, uh, I came up with, I was real preparing for a presentation I had in Texas. Um, and I actually started writing and writing and writing and writing, um, all these different, um, materials that were kind of based on my whole approach, but I started kind of putting them into a context and writing my own curriculum. And right. I've always had, um, an affinity toward movement. Uh, when I was younger, um, my job was to sweep the kitchen floor uh, after okay. meals. And my dad would always play like, you know, he had his, you know, Motown music or, um, you know, what else did he listen to? Just a whole, a whole slew of music from the 70s, the 60s. And I would pretend while I was listening that my broom was like my partner and I would sweep and dance. And I just have always, uh, you know, I've had a little dance background and I've just always as a young kid connected music with movement. That's how I teach. That's how I conduct to me. Music and movement are like peanut butter and jelly. Like you just, they're just interrelated. Right. And when my kids would move, they would sing better. And when my choirs would take the music and make it into an actual movement, or I could show a gesture through movement, it just revolutionized their sound. And I kind of was like, we're onto something here. And um, the more that I researched, the more that I just sort of looked into the connection, even in the ORF method that really relies heavily upon movement, I just found more and more connections. And I, I love researching and I love learning. And um, I love then being able to take it and put my own spin on it. And through the process, that's really what I did with this book. And I, I mean, it was divine inspiration. I would literally be walking, uh, taking a walk outside. And I just remember I would literally have a song come to me. I'm thinking I must look like the most, the biggest weirdo. I'm walking and I'm like singing a song. I'm thinking and doing body percussion while I'm walking. Cause I'm like, I gotta write this down. You know, <laughs> I remember one time driving and hearing this absolute Gershwin is my absolute favorite composer. Yeah. And I just, I love, love, love him. And I was driving in on K-Bach. There was this version of summertime that I had never heard before. And it was stunning. And I remember pulling over and writing down the artist because I'm like, this is an activity. I'm going to use this. And it was That's... just like literally months of that. And, um, it took hours to compile, but I was just came up with my approach, kind of what I've been doing in my classroom all this time, but putting it into a context of how can, and my heart is always to, I love my students and I want them to succeed, but on a bigger level, I have such a heart for music teachers and I want them yeah. to be able to have success. And a lot of them don't have vocal training, but they're thrown into these classrooms where they have to lead a choir or they have to sing and they're not necessarily um, trained in vocal pedagogy. And just through my course, like I was saying before, of the mentors I've studied with, there is so much to voice that just... I mean, just that's not really taught exactly. And right. So, so anyway, I saw a lot of. Well, it's, it's, it's even perceived. Like, if, if people ask you, you know, you're a musician 
and they'll ask you know, what instrument and you'll say voice. And obviously people are going to immediately go, or a lot of people are going to go, Oh, just that, you know, oh, but it's, <laughs> I, there's so much but, to it. But they have no, they have no idea the kind of care and the kind of, uh, um, uh, work that goes into, oh, gosh, you know, it goes into making a good sound and making it, uh, uh consistent and making it, uh, with, with energy and, and, uh, with life. It's, yes. It's, it's, there's so much to it. Oh, there's so much. Yes. Ex- you said that so well. And it's just, again, the more I study, the more, and the more I listen to artists that I hear that are doing it right. You just realize the, it is such an art form and is such a skill. I mean, it's, it's huge, right. you know? Right. So it is a skill. It's not just a talent. No. Oh, it's a skill. <laughs> no. And that's your, I'm glad you said that it is such a skill. You may have a natural propensity, but it is such a skill, it's such a discipline. Yes. You know, for sure. And, and you do, you see, you show a lot. In fact, you show a lot of that and, and your book goes into, um, I, I have to say, I was laughing at one of them because I remember one of these little exercises I did in, in college in our choir. It was the bubble gum, double bubble gum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. And, oh, well, and I remember, you know, we would go, you know, bubble gum, bubble gum, bubble gum, double. And I don't know how I, I, I've just glanced at your book, so I haven't gone through it in, in detail. Um, but, uh, you know, double bubble gum, double bubble gum, triple double bubble gum, yes. triple double, yes. quadruple, triple double bubble gum, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> until we ran out of bubbles. It was just amazing. So, um, so I, I do just for my, you know, just for me. Tell me about that exercise and what does it do? What does what something like that help us? Why do we do that as a singer? So, okay. So first of all, one of the, that really, uh, there's two specific things that that warm up is going to help you with. The first one is diction. Um, and diction is really all about how you pronounce the, uh, your consonants and how you are able to use your articulators, your teeth, your tongue, and your, your lips to really be able to speak a word so that it's understood and that you're speaking it in a certain placement in your face that is going to have the most, we call that resonance. And by resonance, mm-hmm. it's going to be the ability to be able to be heard and to be projected with the most, the least amount of effort. And oh, beautiful. Yeah. resonance is really um, what you're going for. Your skull, your sinus cavities are all, I mean, there are parts of your body that are natural resonators. And when you can tap into them, um, and activate your breath into those resonating chambers, you create the most beautiful sounds with the, um, the most little effort and your voice, um, carries and it creates these beautiful overtones, which are actually vibrations in the sound. Um, so that exercise is really geared to, to train you to produce and articulate your voice in the right to, to speak with clear diction. The other thing it's going to do is, um, Mike, I'm going to have you try this. Um, go ahead and just say, go put your hand on your kind of on your, uh, little above your belly button and okay. just say bubble and tell me what part of your body you felt move. Bubble. It was kind of my, my lower abdomen, a lot of yeah bubble. Good. It was, yeah. Down below. Okay. Now say double bubble. Double bubble. Did you feel it again? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Double bubble. Excellent. So what is actually happening on a physiological level is your solar plexus, which is right attached to kind of in that diaphragm region of your body, is pulsing. And when the diaphragm pulses, the lungs actually um, are able to expand because the diaphragm sinks down. So when you are doing a simple thing, such as saying, Bubblegum, bubblegum, the B, that consonant or the D, those sounds activate the diaphragm and train you to use that part of your body when you're producing a sound. And that, again, it's a muscle that you're trying to activate and engage because when you activate the diaphragm, what you're really doing is you're activating a power source that you have, a natural power source to project and to create energy in the voice. Now, what I tell this all to my child, my my, my students, I would, here's the thing. Kids are brilliant. And this is something that I, um, this is one of my just philosophies is that they should know anatomy. 
we don't want to bog them down with details. We don't need to go into the minutia that maybe right. we as educators would need to know, but they are smart. And I think it's important that as vocal teachers, we don't just use analogies that are not based in science. An analogy makes so much more sense when a, a child or an adult understands the premise of why you're making that analogy. So there has to be this this understanding of science, but it's backed by an actual, maybe an analogy that a child could grasp, but there has to be right. a, a blend of both. Yeah. And, and I also think um, for those who um, aren't musical necessarily, or, the, or, or maybe singing isn't their thing, this is such an important skill as a, as a public speaker, yes. as somebody, I mean, these understanding the voice, how it works. I loved how you talked about, you know, the, the resonating chambers, because we don't think of our, as our, of our head as being a resonating or our body for that matter, no. as being a resonating chamber. And it really, it, I mean, it is a much larger chamber than a, than a violin has, for example. Yes. Um, you know, it is, it is, it's, it's, it, it's got a lot of depth and beauty to it. If you can tap into, to that source. Yes. And you know what? I think that's a um, it's a really valid point about for public speaking. I think that um, when you learn how to use your voice in such a way that you're really using the least amount of effort um, and getting the best sound, you're absolutely right. It works in public speaking. The other big thing, too, is you're learning how not to tire out your voice because a lot of people will experience oh, so discomfort because they're not utilizing their voice in the best way. And just like you said, for any kind of public speaking, um, it also, it, it has, I mean, think about it, how you stand, your body language says a lot about your confidence and in the same way when you can speak with a certain um, confidence and center and projection and resonance, you're really in, you're embodying confidence. And that goes a long way when you're, if you're interviewing, if you are um, speaking to clients, if you know, if you own a business and you're trying to sell, there's is so many ramifications for your voice. Because if you think about it, your voice is really your tool to communicate with the world. Right. It's really true. That is, that's a great, great point. Um, and and I love the physicality that you have in your book. As you, I mean, I having sung in many choirs and and lots of different circumstances. Um, I haven't seen quite the um, the amount of movement um, that I see. And even props, you, you use a lot of uh, handkerchiefs. Yes. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and by the way, and I, I do mention it for um, for those of you who do purchase this book, it it, it um, does come with videos. Um, is that right? And also, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, different different ideas. I mean, it's it is there's a lot of material for people to dig into. But um, and we can talk about some of that. But 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 the, your use of movement and your use of props, um, I think specifically with with uh, with kids are, are very helpful because they can actually see and feel well with everybody. You can feel and you can see how um, how these movements affect. Um, I'll give you an example. As I was I was watching one of your videos um, on on how to um, create an active. Um, it was one of uh, I can't remember exactly which one now, but it was one of your warm ups that you're doing, and, you, and you're doing a movement to help to create this this active flow. And you did two different things. One was with a, a handkerchief, and then another one was more of a circular motion that you made with your arms. And and you could hear a difference. Um, they were both beautiful, but they were both different. And you can hear a difference between the, what you were trying to accomplish with the action and the sound that was coming out of your mouth. Yes. Um, and, and it was just, it was just different. It was not um, a, uh, um, what am I trying to say? It, it was one of those things that, that just, if you're going for a certain sound, if you're trying to do a certain thing, a movement really helps you tap into that. Hands down, Mike. And, you know, there's a book I would recommend to your readers um, that I, I've, I've read parts of it, and it's phenomenal. It's called Sound in Motion, and it's by David McGill. And I believe that it's, he's an oboe player, um, but it's a phenomenal book. And, I, again, just the more that I have studied, like you just said, the different sounds or the different motions produce different sound, um, that is there is so much truth to that. And when you really, when you think about music 
from the standpoint of even a phrase, there is a, there is a, a shape to every phrase and there is a, a line to every phrase. And in every single, um, every single movement, I really, uh, the more and more I study it, the more that I believe that to get the best sound out of your singers, out of your instrument, is when you can really connect the visual, the imagination, and the movement to the sound, you are then shaping it and you are interpreting it. And that's really where the artistry comes in because you are then it's the nuances and a lot of times the movement i think is a key to unlock the comprehension for somebody to get there right and it is something that's almost um more felt than heard sometimes yes like you can hear a good singer and you can hear them sing a phrase and then you, then you can hear them sing a phrase and the difference is is so stark and yet if you were to try to analyze it you, it'd be hard to to to, differ, uh, to to differentiate yes what they were actually doing but the, the 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 feeling that you received was just remarkably different um and it's just because of that movement it's because of of what they were bringing to that phrase yes. the second one versus the first mhm yeah so um that's that's wonderful tell me um so, so so talk to me about like how should somebody use your book what what is the what how is it organized so it starts out um and it's it's really geared for for any teacher or even if there's somebody who just wants to learn for themselves but it's it's really a toolbox i like to think of it as and uh, uh, just um a resource for, let's say you teach private lessons, maybe you lead a church choir, maybe you are a music teacher. Um, and really the beauty of it is that many of these warm-ups and activities are scaffolded. So if you're working with younger children, you can simplify them and it, they really lend themselves to be, uh, you can differentiate. Um, and the older the the students, the more advanced, there's basically different levels built within every activity. Um, and we did that intentionally because, you know, again, just want it to be something that is going to be able to be utilized by many different age groups, many different people. Um, so first off, the beginning of the book is going to go into some, uh, give you some background on how to train the child's voice. Um, basically, what ranges work for child singing, how children learn best from an educational um, psychology standpoint. I'm fascinated by educational psychology and even just how to get somebody to a place where they're ready to learn. Um, that yeah. to me is also a huge thing because it's not just about what you're teaching, it's how you're teaching it, but then it's what are what atmosphere are you creating to make that child ready to intake knowledge? You know, it's, oh, it's which is so huge. Oh my god! Especially if you're if you're teaching in a school setting, and 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 maybe the uh, there's some boys in the class, for example, that that maybe are there just because it's an, it's an elective that they need to take. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, how do you prepare that kid who to to be inspired enough to want to learn these techniques. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. So the book kind of touches a little bit on that. Um, the other thing, um, and like you said too, there are supplemental materials. So every lesson plan, there are visuals and that you can use to, to, to project on your board or print out. So you don't have to do anything. There's also videos that demonstrate many of the warm ups to show your students or you can use as a resource. Um, so anyway, the first section of the book goes into warm ups and tackles um, things like posture and alignment, breathing. Um, it, it breaks down to head voice, to vowels. You're also going to have sections on the space, tongue, and the jaw, diction. Um, and then there are, of course, there's resonance 
Um, and then this is one of my favorite sections. Oh, there's diaphragmatic engagement. That's a really good one. And then we've got just for fun. Um, and those are just some fun things, uh, some fun warm ups that I've learned over the years that just get your singers um, just smiling and laughing and build kind of camaraderie, which is honestly just as important. So, so that's the, the beginning of the book. And really, these 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 warm ups in and of themselves can really be the the building i would say they're the building blocks for everything mm -hmm. you do and then you move about halfway through the book you're going to move into the lesson plans and these are lesson plans that are designed with specific um, vocal and musical objectives in mind and then we've kind of listed out each objective within each lesson so let's say i'll just give you an example let's say that you are you really need to tackle uh breathing and phrasing with your choir so we've got a great activity in here that utilizes the recording of the swan um that's saint saw's um beautiful piece with the cello from his famous carnival of the animals collection which i just right. adore and we use that piece in such a way that gives students um a real experience with breathing and with phrasing. Now, again, not just singing, um, that's from a musical instrumental standpoint, but I will tell you what I found in my studies is that men, I, and this is not me, who's the first one to say this, but you, you, when you hear beautiful legato lines, specifically with string instruments, there is a replication of the voice, right? I mean, it imitates the voice. And if you can okay. get a student to experience that uh, and hear that beautiful legato, uh, usually a solo instrument line, there is such a correlation to singing. I mean, they just go hand in hand. And this is one of my favorite activities that's in here. I mean, check out my blog because I will be posting some week, some free lessons from the book. And then on the publisher's website, Beaten Path Publications, he also has a free lesson that you can get as well. Um, we talk a little bit about the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, <clears throat> and that's just um, how you learn how to pr create different vowel sounds that, uh, so if you opened up a dictionary um, and you were to, let's say, open up and try to figure out how to pronounce a word in Spanish, the phonetic spelling would would be, you would be using IPA to decipher how to pronounce a vowel. So it's actually an international right. alphabet. Um, we have a lesson on that. And again, these are such great things that kids are able and capable of learning. And this is just giving you a framework in which to present it in. Um, we've also got a lot of ORF arrangements. We've got canons in here. We've got solfege so lessons with teaching solfege and helping kids to differentiate between different solfege um understanding how the scale works and then even so for those who don't know solfege it's the do re mi yeah it's, like the sound of music. music yes yeah, do <laughs> right. here. exactly exactly and those are just in a nutshell your solfege do re mi fa sol la ti do those are the building blocks for melody um, and what your your scale is built upon. Um, so yeah, so the book is just, um, it's a real, just a, a great collection of tools for, um, for you as if you're wanting to learn how to sing better, um, if you're wanting to learn how to teach better. And again, it just step-by-step -step process for every single lesson. Um, and these are, these are all things that I have done with my students and it's been edited and edited and edited so that it's as clear and concise as possible so that you can replicate it. And, and I would tell you one other thing, Mike, um, one of the, the ORF um, method, one of their big proponents, something they value so much is creativity and then taking what you learn and making it your own. And something that my hope would be is that, that teachers would find, um, let's say they would find something in this book, maybe a lesson that really worked well, and then they would be able to utilize that as a template to create their own lesson that would maybe target the same or a different vocal technique. But um, these these ideas are meant to be expanded on. They may not, they are not meant to be done verbatim. They can be, but they by no means have to be. So these, these lessons are, definitely um, 
you know, they're able to be melded and molded into what your classroom needs would be. And then to be taken and used to maybe create something that's um, an extension of what we have in the book. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful thing. And 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 as I as I've read through parts of this, I mean, it is very clear. I love, you know, the it's you can I can tell you can tell when a lot of work has been done, especially on the editing side. Oh my god! Because you can was, you, ah. you can see it's just it's so clear. Like you you are trying to say what you are saying. Thank you. And anybody, whether um, no matter where you are on the musical spectrum, can read and understand this book and, and get a lot out of it. Um, you know, I'm thinking of of maybe homeschool parents who, yes. who want to, who want their children to learn, um, you know, some, some really basic musical techniques and maybe don't have a piano, don't have a violin. Well, your voice is one of the greatest mm-hmm. instruments and, and you Amen. can learn so much from that. Um, you know, and, and I think this is, this is a wonderful, um, yeah, it's a great resource for people. I have to give props to my editor. <laughs> yeah. His name is Brent Hall. He's the owner and the founder of Beaten Path Publications. We started um, we started working on the book um, in August. Where I had the material. I mean, I had approached him in August. We started collaborating together in August. Did not get published until June. And I just want to give a big shout out to him because Brent. Um, Brent was relentless in his pursuit for, for being, clarity. For clarity, and I am so thankful for him because he really um, he pushed me to make it the best it could be. And he was kind of I felt like he was like my personal trainer, you know. And I learned yeah. so much from him, and he was so patient with me. Um, this being my first book, you could say, and um, just seeing the transformation of where it started and where it came to. He was honestly, I, I couldn't have done it without him. And um, Brent, one of the things that I just uh, admire and appreciate so much about him, I would, I would ask him and say, "All right, is it? Are we done? Are we done?" And he would say, "It will be done when it will be done." And <laughs> I'm, I'm your typical New Yorker. I like operate in New York minute. Like, let's go, let's get it done. And I, you know, and he just. Um, He's from Virginia and he is just the most patient, mellow uh, person. And he and his wife, actually, uh, Karen as well, she does a lot, some of the editing with him as well. And they are just fabulous. And I, I just want to give a shout out to Brent and Karen because um, they, their, 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 um, their eye and their clarity, their conciseness is all over this book. I remember in college, I'll just a funny story, Mike, I, I could write, uh, you could ask me one question, very simple question. I could probably give you an answer for like, um, I don't know, an hour, like hence this whole podcast, right? Like you, I could probably tell you about this book in like two minutes, but no, I just love to talk. So no, he it, always would be like, passion, yes, so. no, but he would always say, how can you say that in less words? So that has been my dilemma for years, but he helped me to, to, to learn to be a little oh, more concise. <laughs> So That's yes, wonderful. thank you, Brent and Karen. Oh well, yes, thank you, Brent and Karen, and thank you, Lisa. I, wrapping up here for, in a minute, what what's next for you? What what's your what what are plans for Lisa coming up? Well, um, coming up, we are I'm in the process of really trying to brainstorm and just humbly think through how I can make music a reality in the lives of my students as we go back into the school year. And as we are getting, you know, just kind of looking at what August is going to be, how can they still experience um, the arts? And that's something that I am just, I'm, I'm like, all right, it's time to start, um, not being afraid and to start being creative. And that's, that's my, that's what I'm going to be working on. Um, uh, I think we need to have a discussion about that. Oh yeah. I would, I would be happy to share with you. I mean, I'm just kind of like, I'm, I am so uh, convinced on the, the importance of the arts in our world. And I will fight to make it a reality for these kids. So that's, that's where I'm at. And then with choir, Brevity Chorus, check us out. We are a community choir in Gilbert. um, And we're in the process of getting set for our August 
our August uh, start date for our fall semester, starting to get repertoire ready. We're not sure yet if we're going to be meeting online for the beginning, or my hope obviously is in person, but whatever the, whatever the platform, we will be having a concert and in this this year whatever it looks like i'm not sure yet but um so that's happening and then the last thing which is really cool i'll have to send to you um i'm launching a um a music studio so lisa michelle music studio and oh, all of my uh yeah i'm growing growing my private studio as well um with the hopes of maybe one day being in a brick and mortar location so right now I, I go to people's homes, I travel, I teach online remotely. Um, and yeah, and that's kind of in the process as well. So I'll, I'll send you the website. We're working on a website right now when that's all done. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, do that. And, and uh, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about those things again. Let's, let's do this again. This was so I would fun, love Lisa. That. I love that. Oh, well, thank you. So again, Lisa Blasi, you can find her on her blog, which is what? The blog is going to be something to sing about. Um, and it's actually, it's something to sing about 315. And it's blogspot.com. Something to sing about 315.blogspot.com. Spot, sorry, dot com. <laughs> <laughs> and all the and all these links will be in the in the show notes. Um, and then the book is something to think uh, something to think about something to that sing too. about. Yes, always. <laughs> we always have things to think about. Always, but 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 if we can sing about it, it, it just goes much better. Oh yes, agreed. It's <laughs> oh, funny. So, well, let's do this again. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm really grateful. And uh, yeah, let's talk soon. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. You bet. This is Mike Levitt with And If Love Remains. Um, check us out at www.andifloveremains.com. You can also there's also a, a merch uh, site there, so you can pick up a, a mug or a. I don't think we have t-shirts quite yet, but they will be coming. Um, you can get your face mask though. If you need a face mask, you can get your And If Love Remains face mask. So um, check it out there. See you next time.